So uh, I'm going to talk about quantitative finance. So let me start by saying a little bit about what that is. And so one definition would be it's applying scientific, mathematical, or statistical methods to financial problems. So that's hopelessly vague, but I'd like to flesh that out a little bit. So the basic objects of study are markets. So a market could be a stock market or a bond market, foreign exchange or derivatives, just anything you're trading makes a market. And the things you trade on a market it could be actual things, like pieces of paper, like stock certificates, or it could be something just very abstract and intangible, like, say, a futures contract on an interest rate, which we'll talk about maybe in a minute. So how do markets actually work? So what is the stock market? How does the stock market function? So the basic idea is that you have a bunch of people who have stuff that they're trying to, tra to trade. So in the stock market, they have, say, stock shares. And people will make a market. So they'll say, look, I have this stuff, and I'm willing to sell it to you for a certain price. Or I'm willing to buy it from you at some other price. So they'll submit standing offers, say, OK, anybody who has, you know, 100 shares of IBM at $90, I'm willing to buy that. Or if anybody wants to buy you know, 200 shares of IBM for $102, I'll sell it to them. So you get this whole collection of offers, and somebody needs to go, the exchange needs to go and combine them all into sort of a combined best, best offer. So they, they look at all the different offers out there, and they say, this is the best price for buying, and this is the best price for selling, and then they publish that information. So for example, maybe the best price for some stock is, you know, you can buy it at 202.39 and you can sell it at 202.32. So then other people come into the market and they hit the prices. So they look at those prices that are available and they say, okay, I'll buy that, you know, I'll take you up on that offer and I'll buy that uh, stock at 202.39. And then if they do that, then you actually have a transaction. So then this thing, whatever it is, changes hands, and you have what's called a trade. So then after the trade happens, the exchange needs to, needs to update. You know, so now, now there's not as much, you know, there's one fewer offer out there in the market, so the exchange needs to record the fact that a trade happened and update the new best bid and best offer. So one immediate consequence that actually is important is that any time you make a trade, if you're one of these people who wants to go out and buy, say, a, you know, 100 shares of IBM, that immediately changes the price, potentially, because all of a sudden there's less available liquidity. So typically the exchange wants people out there making markets. They want people, in, in order to get the thing working, you need to have these orders out there to start with. And so typically the exchange will subsidize the market makers and offer them some money back for every trade that happens. And conversely, anybody who actually hits one of those orders has to pay a fee, um, which goes to the market makers. So this is just a visual um, image of that structure. So you might have, you know, again, this might be prices. Um, and the ones on top would be offers to sell. Um, Sorry, to buy, and the ones on the bottom would be offers to uh, sorry, to get it backwards, <laughs> sell and then buy. So the arrows just you know tell you that the um, you know the arrow represents a buy or a sell depending on which direction it's in. So the idea is that the farther out you go, the worse the price gets, the more um, liquidity tends to be there. So there's tends if you if you really want to buy this expensive thing at 99.9. .9, there will be more opportunities to do that than to buy the cheapest one at 99.7. Okay, so historically, this, this structure has been around for a long time. So the New York Stock, Stock Exchange is this old institution, and it basically worked the same way, you know, um, when it was set up, except that it was actually maintained by people. The actual humans were making these markets. So there were these people called specialists who would sort of keep track of the best bid and the best um, offer, and they would, um, you know, anytime somebody wanted to 
buy a stock, they would just be there to say, okay, this is the best I have right now in this particular stock. Um, and they would also step in if there wasn't enough liquidity, enough liquidity available, they would step in and say, you know, okay, nobody's out there to, to, do, um, to offer this price right now, but, you know, I'm going to step in and offer it to you just so that there's some market available. But that's sort of gone by the wayside. So now it's a very different landscape, and there's no people on the, you know, uh, making these markets. It's just computers. So all these order books are maintained on things called ECNs, which are electronic communication networks. And really, you can just think of that as a, a computer, which, which runs the stock exchange. So instead of having guys out there keeping track of all the best prices, it's just all goes, the exchange simply matches up the best, um, the, uh, the market makers with the market takers electronically. So it's much more efficient. And there's all these different exchanges now, and um, you know, they're actually hard to keep track of. So all of these are examples of exchanges that trade stocks in, you know, on the, what used to be just the New York Stock Exchange. So if you want to buy IBM, you know, you can do it through INET, ARCA, NICE, EdgeX, EdgeA, or actually CME is um, for um, options. That's Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So there's been this proliferation of these electronic exchanges, and they're always buying and selling each other, and it's very hard to keep track of them. So the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole picture is actually much more complicated than it used to be. Okay, so what are these things that people transact? So a stock, for instance. Well, a stock is basically just a piece of a company. Um, and oftentimes stock pays, stocks pay dividends. Sometimes they don't. But it really doesn't matter um, what they are. The important thing is that you can trade them. So, you, you know, they used to be represented by actual paper certificates. And now, again, just as like the physical stock exchanges, that's... No longer the case. They're all basically electronic. And the question of what a stock is worth is, is sort of a whole different can of worms. But, you know, the original theory, the sort of classical theory would say that, you know, the price of a stock should be determined by the expected value of all future dividend payments. Um, but then... Some people would just say there's no intrinsic value of a stock. So like this third theory would just say the value of a stock is whatever people are willing to pay for it, and it's just determined by the market, and that's all you can say. But from our point of view, it doesn't really matter. So from our point of view, all that matters is that there exist these things that trade, and um, you, know, you can analyze the prices of them. Okay, so another thing that might trade is what's called a futures contract. Um, so these are things that are traded in Chicago, and these are based on the same principles, but it's, um, it's a different thing. So the futures contract is just a deal, basically, that you set up um, for some time in the future for some price that you establish now. So for instance, in this, in this example, you might be setting up a delivery of oil. So you want to lock in the price of oil, and so you make an agreement that you're going to buy 100 barrels of oil in March at some price that you fix now, say $100. And the, the key is that this is all standardized. So there's, uh, because what you want to be able to do is trade these things. And in order to trade something, you need to have a, a standard, you need to know exactly what it is that you're exchanging. And so there are these contracts, futures contracts, which specify exactly what's meant by you know, um, by oil, by acceptable, you know, grade of oil and an acceptable um, delivery place and just all the, all, there's a whole lot of small details in here that's just guarantee that this thing is a standard object which can be exchanged and you know what you're getting. So the use of a futures contract would be, there's, there's several different uses. You might use it just to hedge your risk if you're a business. So your business might be sensitive to the price of oil you might be concerned that oil is going to get more expensive, and so you might want to lock in the price right now in case, um, and so you're sort of insured against a spike in the price of oil. Or you might not have anything to do with, you know, um, you might not actually, ha your business might have nothing to do with oil. You might just be a speculator. You might think that the price of oil is going to go up, and so you might just want to buy one of these contracts, 
and then, and then sell it again at an increased price and just lock in a profit that way. Typically, the people who trade these never take delivery on them. You know, so there's, there's all kinds of things, futures contracts. There's cattle, there's cotton. And most of the people who buy them, if you're, if you're buying a cotton future, you really don't actually want them to deliver a big bundle of cotton to your doorstep. And if that does happen, you're usually in a lot of trouble. Uh, so, so it's very important that you buy and then you get out of the position before it expires. So these are traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Okay, one other sort of flavor of financial instrument is a derivative. So a derivative is just something which is derived from a stock or something simpler. So typically a stock. So a stock is just this thing and a derivative is something you can make out of a stock. So for example, a call option is just an agreement to buy some stock, IBM or whatever, at some price, say $100, at some time in the future, say March 1st. Okay, and so that, that ab ability to buy it, so you're saying that I'm gonna have the option, this is slightly vague, with the, you know, uh, imprecise the way I worded this, but it gives you an option to buy this thing at this locked in price. You don't necessarily have to. So it may turn out that the stock has gotten um, cheaper in March, and so then it would be foolish of you to actually buy it for you know, $100 if you could buy it for $90. So it's called a call option because you have the option to buy it at $100, which will make you a lot of money in the case that the stock actually gets more expensive. Okay, so if the price is 110 in March, then you cash in because you're buying it for 100. Okay, and so these are kind of related to those futures contracts. In fact, futures are a type of derivative as well. And they're also useful for things like hedging. If your, say, portfolio has a big exposure to, you know, some given stock, then you can hedge it using, uh, you can control that risk with these options. Or again, if you think that, the, that you know something about where the stock is moving, you can amplify your profits by trading these, these options. So just a historical thing, as an example of the sort of thing that math people were able to contribute to the financial world. So these options, these call options used to trade, there's a big, you know, people wanted to, to trade them. They're very useful um, instruments, but nobody was really sure what the right price was for them. So, you know, the banks would sell them, but they uh, were very kind of, um, you know, unconfident about, the, about what the price should be. So they would quote big spreads. So, you know, it would be very expensive to buy one of these because, you know, buying and selling, there was a big, there was a big gap in the price between the, the buying and the selling. So then these uh, mathematicians came along and they used a bunch of fairly sophisticated techniques um, of partial differential equations to develop a price which, if you make various assumptions, and those assumptions can be controversial. But if you're willing to make various assumptions about the way stocks behave, then you can actually derive a fair price for one of these options. And that actually had a huge impact because all of a sudden, um, you know, it was possible to trade these much more efficiently. And so the use of these, of these derivatives sort of took off. Now there's dangers associated with that as well because you know, they used this model, which made a bunch of assumptions, and they stopped questioning those assumptions. And so then, you know, I think sometimes this is a, a sort of cautionary thing when you're doing quantitative finance is that people put too much faith in the model, and they stop thinking about what are the underlying assumptions, and then you can sort of uh, create sort of things like the financial crisis of 2008, which my company had nothing to do with. Okay, um, so getting into actual sort of mathematical techniques, the or statistical techniques, if you just record every time there's a trade and you write down what the price of that trade was, you just get the sequence of numbers. Okay, and um, the sort of term that people use for that is a time series. But it's really just a sequence of numbers and so there's just various statistical techniques for analyzing these.
these sequences. Uh, so the picture on the left here, just to give you an idea of what they look like, is um, sort of the all of the ticks of Google for one day. Um, you know, with some scale. So you know, if you zoom in, it's it's kind of a fractally looking picture. Um, so it, it, it continues to look volatile, you know, no, no matter what uh, time scale you look at it. But um, you know, it's really just very simple. It's just a sequence of of, star of uh, prices. And so somehow you want to try to deduce some structure from these series and um, potentially make predictions. But we'll get into that in a second. Okay, so in order to do anything useful, you need to have some kind of a model. So really, most of this quantitative finance business is just is just about selecting models, and uh, you know then calibrating the models and you know uh, making predictions with the models. So one of the very first models, one of the most important models for a stock price, is the random walk model. So the basic idea there is very simple. So it's kind of just saying we don't know what the price of the stock is going to be tomorrow. Okay, so what's the best way to model it is basically just a coin flip. Okay, I mean, it's, I don't know what it is. Flip a coin. And so you just um, say that that's how the price of the stock evolves. It's just every sort of instant in time, there's going to be a coin flip. And the price of the stock will go up or down depending on if you got heads or tails. And so if you just look at the prices that evolve according to that rule, you get what is called a random walk. And um, that's sort of the basic model of a stock price is as a random walk. Now, if you want to get more sophisticated, you know, the one thing about that model is that it's discrete time. So you're just assuming, okay, there's one second we have a price, and then there's going to be a trade, you know, one second later, and you'll have another price. So every second you'll have a new price. But it'd be kind of nice if you go back to the picture here. This curve looks sort of continuous. So it doesn't look like there's any breaks. And it looks like it's sort of evolving continuously over time. So if you try to take a limit as the um, unit of time goes to zero, you end up with, with this thing called Brownian motion. And so you know the stochastic calculus is kind of a technical thing, which I won't get into. but you know, the important thing is just that there exists a continuous model, which is modeled um, by some sort of a probabilistic differential equation. Okay. Okay, so I wanted to give you some idea of just the big picture of the financial industry. Um, so it kind of, you can split it into two pieces. There's the buy side and the sell side. So the buy side are the people who are trying to, they have some need that they're trying to satisfy. They're, they want to buy something or, you know, actually maybe they want to sell something. So the terms are a little misleading. But basically they want to say, you know, like a mutual fund that wants to um, buy some stock or, you know, it's going to be um, somebody that wants to buy one of those derivatives that I was talking to you about because they want to hedge their risk or it's going to be somebody that has some kind of a need. And then these sell side firms are the people like the investment banks like you know, Goldman Sachs or someplace, where they try to take these sort of desires of other people and they'll try to um, sell them some product, some financial product that will you know, satisfy those needs. So um, my company is actually on the buy side. So we're a proprietary trading desk. So a proprietary trading company is like a hedge fund. Um, well, a hedge fund, first of all, is like a mutual fund which is just some guy that is going to take your money and buy some stocks with it and going to try to sort of generate a large amount of return and it's going to you know they're going to give you the the profits from or the losses of from the decisions that they make so a hedge fund is is the same principle it's just that it's more restricted and um so not anybody can invest in it and um so they they tend to take sort of more exotic positions that you know casual investors should probably be afraid of. Um, and then a, a proprietary trading company or trading desk is it's the same idea as a hedge fund. Even you're, they're trying to make profits based on trading activity. The only difference is they don't actually have investors. They just have their own money. 
So they just invest. So you know, in my company, you know, there's the boss, the CEO, or whatever, the owner. So he has this fund, and we just try to help him make money on that, on that fund. So uh, the advantage of that is that you know the hedge funds or the you know mutual funds are, um, you know, they're always prone to having withdrawals. And so if you know if the market's going bad, people pull out all their money. So the nice thing about a proprietary trading company is that the money is just all all there and can't be taken away. Okay. Okay. So how do math people fit in this picture? So so quant first of all. That's kind of the catch-all term for somebody with, you know, um, math skills uh, who is in the finance industry. So, what do they do? I guess um, these are the basic things. So, as I said, the models are the important thing for most of these um, positions. You just have some sort of a mathematical model for some financial process, and then you need to first of all decide how that model is going to be. Um, you know what what the actual terms are in the model, so what the actual mathematical recipe is that you're using, and then once you actually even have that concept, there's a lot of work left to do. You have to code it on the computer, you have to uh, figure out the right parameters for the model. I mean, typically there'll be some knobs to turn, and you have to figure out the right value for the knobs. And so even after that happens, you still have to get it working. You have to have it sort of connected to a an exchange to trade with. And then once you, even, once you have it trading and you're generating some profit, hopefully, you need to be able to look at it and see if it's working correctly. So a lot of this actually, if, I don't know if there's any people from physics here or sciences, but a lot of this, this sort of um, stuff that quants do is sort of a scientific uh, feel to it. So you're, you're designing experiments and you're running the experiments on some sort of real data and then you're looking at the results. Um, and then finally, you know, if this is all sort of real world stuff, so you have to be available in case the thing blows up and somebody gets mad at you. Okay, so within that universe, there's actually sort of two other, there's another sort of split. There's, there's um, the sort of traditional model of quant, which is kind of the more famous model, I think. Which again comes from that Black Scholes equation um, was sort of the original um, appearance of these guys. So it's um, to price those derivatives, okay, which I was talking about. So th this is sort of a big topic, and you know the Black Scholes equation certainly did not um, finish the story. But basically, the general problem here is to say, look, there's something that somebody wants to buy. And I want to know what I should charge them for it. And I can't, usually if you want to know how much something costs, you just look in the market and you say, well, okay, what's it trading for? But in this case, it's not trading. There's no market for it. You're making the market. So you have to figure out what the fair price is. So what you need to do is sort of take a look at what the prices you see are for things that are trading and try to use those prices to deduce what the price should be for this thing that's not trading. So, and the methods they use can get fairly sophisticated. So there's, you know, the stochastic calculus, partial differential equations, Monte Carlo techniques, um, and um, these are typically the sell side companies, like the big investment banks, will have desks of traders um, using these models to uh, sell these products. Okay, on the other side is people who just sort of, uh, you know, don't mess with the fancy things like that. It's just say, you know, what's the price of IBM going to be? You know, uh, in a little while. So you know, you just—it's—it's it's sort of simpler techniques. You don't use these uh, sort of elegant theories, but you—you um, you, you want to sort of build some sort of models that will predict the price of the of the stock or whatever it is in the future. And it's sort of distinct from you know, typically if you're just a quantitative person like myself, so you don't know anything about economics necessarily. And you're just using the actual price data, okay? So, like I, like I said, we have these sort of series of values that the stock traded at, and so the idea is basically just to use those numbers that you saw before and try to predict what numbers are going to come later. So it's it's a nice thing from somebody, you know, with a math background because you don't actually need to know anything. Um, so, except math, okay? 
So the math can be very useful. So um, the other thing, of course, once you have the prediction, you need to put the prediction to work. So part of it is generating predictions, and part of it is, is generating the actual trading strategy that will take advantage of those predictions. And you don't just want to make money. You want to minimize the money that you're going to lose. So you, um, you have to analyze the risk. But typically, you know, these people, um, the techniques are more just sort of statistical or um, just sort of general, general sort of analysis that um, you know, doesn't use, again, these um, fancy techniques of the derivative modeling. And these people are typically on the buy side. So um, this uh, picture you know, came from some magazine. I, I think it's a kind of out of date, actually. But this is to give you a general idea of where the jobs are in this area. So you know, there, there's sort of big chunks in a lot of different areas here. So there's the trading companies, like my company is um, a chunk. There's the derivative people I was talking about is another chunk. There's a lot of people doing risk management. So there's quantitative ways to try to analyze the risk that a company might have. And then there, you know, I'll let you look at these other things. There's people who do quantitative portfolio management, which is just sort of way, another way of uh, combining your assets to sort of maximize something. And um, fixed income is bond uh, traders, stuff like that. Uh, credit risk is uh, sort of the infamous one with the, uh, you know, things like the mortgage-backed securities. So my company is actually, um, I think I can say this. So I'm sort of, you know, hooked up to electric shocking devices in case I say something uh, about my company that I'm not supposed to say. Um, but um, I think I can say high frequency trading. Yes. OK. Um, so we're a high frequency trading company, uh, meaning that we trade stocks trying to make a profit in the future. And we try to make this profit on a small, sh on a short-term basis. So, you know, um, a slow-frequency comp trading company like a mutual fund or something might say, okay, I think the price of IBM is going to go up, you know, 10% in, you know, six months. And so they'll buy a bunch of it. So in uh, our case, the time scale is not six months. Uh, so I had what the time scale was, and then I had to get this legal disclaimer about <laughs> I can't tell you what the time scale is. Um, but it's, it's significantly less than six months. So um, you try to make small bets on short-term predictions. Um, and of course, the short-term predictions, you know, the stock's not going to go up 10% in a, you know, small time window. So in order to make a short-term prediction profitable, you know, every trade is, is going to be just a very small profit. So in order to make any money from this whole game, you have to make a lot of trades. Um, whereas the slow frequency guys could just make one huge trade and just wait to see if it pays off. The high frequency people have to make millions of trades and just hope to see them accumulate. So um, the orders themselves, you know, if you're making millions of trades, you can't actually be calling your broker. So the orders are actually generated by computers. So we have, you know, there's a, a program which will take input from the market and will produce output of, say, a decision to buy or to sell or to not do anything. So you'll have these algorithms programmed, and they'll be connected straight to the market. And again, the market is not a person anymore. It's just another computer. So you just have these computers hooked up to this other computer running these algorithms um, trading with each other. Um, so then, you know, there are people called traders in our company, but, you know, they're just, they're sitting, you know, in their, um, you know, with the screens, and they're just sort of watching how everything goes. They're not really making decisions. They're just kind of monitoring the system on the fly. So this is a, you know, this is a big deal now as far as the, you know, percentage of the market. So most of the trades that, are, that happen on, say, the New York Stock Exchange or, you know, all over the world, really, most of the trades that happen in, are, from high frequency trading companies. So some of the um, features of high frequency trading is that it's very sensitive to latency. 
So latency is just the speed with which you're able to react to market events. And so there are you know, a lot of other, you know, there's a lot of competition in this, in this business. So there are a lot of these people who are trying to, you know, sensing the same opportunities that you might be sensing. And if, you, if the exchange, so if something happens and these two people are reacting to it in the same way, the exchange, you know, can't give both of the people the trade. So it's going to give it on a first come first serve basis. So whoever gets there first gets the execution, gets the trade. So as a consequence, you know, you just see that there's a, an incentive to be the one who gets there first. So you have to try to be the one who reacts the most quickly to any given market event. And so this becomes, you know, sort of an arms race in terms of the technology. So if you want to be the first, you have to, you know, you know, it's, it's just trying to have the fastest possible computer system, basically. So you have to have your computer sort of right next to the, you know, like physically right next to the exchange's computer because, you know, the speed of light is a factor here. And it, it takes too long for light to travel, you know, from, you know, Austin to New York. So you have to actually have your computer in New York. And, um, you know, it's getting to the point where I guess, you know, uh, the sort of, you have to look at the coefficient of the speed of light in a vacuum versus in a, you know, glass versus, you know, they're using radio frequencies now. So it's, it's really uh, become a little bit crazy. Um, but that's just the way the rule, the way the game works right now. Whoops. And I should say, typically, you know, like our company, for instance, um, would prefer that that didn't happen. You know, you can try to sort of be fast or you can, you know, have the fastest, you know, some people will sort of win and they sort of have profitable strategies just because they are s the super fastest people out there. So they've, they've sort of gamed the system so that they're, uh, well, that's kind of a provocative term, but they're, you know, they've just got the fastest systems and so they, they win all these races. Um, Whereas other people, so we try to just be smarter and say like, okay, well, we have to be fast, but we'll just try to make better, have a better prediction. And so we would much prefer if sort of the latency was out of the equation. But, um, but that's the way the rules are right now. So also sort of on the, on the positive side is that these strategies tend to be very stable as far as the profit. At least, you know, as, as long as you're still sort of not getting squeezed out by faster people. If, as long as you're able to make trades, Typically, the returns that you see are very stable because, you know, it's just sort of a, a statistical feature that if you're making a lot of bets, you know, the more bets you make, the less the, the less the variance, uh, the less variance you have. It's just sort of a basic thing of you know, it's how casinos make money. You know, they don't know that they're going to win every time that somebody plays blackjack. They just know they have a 51% chance of winning, and so. If you have like just one person playing blackjack against them, that's not a great deal for them because they could lose a lot of money. But if you have a thousand people playing blackjack 24 hours a day, they do really well because you know eventually everything sort of evens out and they make a very steady profit. Um, and that's kind of the way the high frequency trading works. On the other hand, you know there's it's it's sort of not, you know it sounds sort of too good to be true, but it's there's there's sort of only so much you can do with it actually. I mean you. You can't, like the mutual funds can make, you know, billions and billions of dollars potentially because there's, there's very little limit to, you know, they can, they can basically put as much money as they want into whatever strategy they have, typically. Whereas here, there's a limited amount of um, money you can actually put into this strategy because it goes back to what I said on the first slide about the impact that you have on the market when you make a trade. So at a given time, there's only so much liquidity in the market and you know, on either side, people buying or selling. So if you try to, you know, if you have a prediction and if you try to take too much, you know, if you try to sort of buy too much, you're going to affect the price, and you're not going to make any money on that trade. So you're only you're, you're sort of limited in the amount that you can amount of money you can make by the amount of liquidity that you see in the market at any given time, and that sort of puts an upper bound on the total return that you can get from a strategy like this. So one other thing is that within the high-frequency world, there's kind of another split between people who are the active traders who sort of, you know, see a quote and, you know, hit it, again, like I was talking on the first slide, versus the people who are, there's high-frequency traders who will be placing orders and, um, and canceling them, okay? So, so there's people on trying to hit, and there's people who are making the market. And so the... the the active people, the people who are buying and who are actually sort of buying and selling what they see on display, 
they're just trying to make money just the old-fashioned way of the price goes up, and then you know I'm going to hopefully make money if I'm buying low. Um, but the passive people are trying to make money based on the spread. So you know if the price never moves, right? So I let's go back here. This picture I had back here. So if this is the price of the stock and it never moves, then you know somebody somebody could who's just selling here at 99.7 and buying here at 90 so and buying here at 99.4 if they're just always sort of have that money have those um, offers out there and people are constantly you know hitting them then this person is going to be making money because he's he's buying at 99.4 and he's selling at 99.7 he's he's buying high and selling low and he's making the spread every time the position turns over. Now the problem with that strategy is that there's no guarantee the price is not going to move. You know, so if the price stays here, you're in great shape. But if the price starts to move, you're exposed. And the price could move against you and you could lose a lot of money. So the trick on the, on the, for the passive traders is to, you know, they have to not only get in there fast at the times that are sort of um, opportune, but they have to know when to cancel. They have to cancel before something bad happens. Okay. So, um, just to give you an idea of again what sort of goes into one of these strategies as far as putting it on the market in the marketplace, you start with some exchange, which is again a computer, and then the computer, you know, this exchange is going to spit out data. It's going to spit out prices and you know uh, quotes and stuff, and so that data is a huge amount of data, terabytes of data, and so somebody has to be able to handle that data. They have to be able to you know, uh, store it and access it and clean it up because a lot of times there's errors in it. So there's a big sort of um, job uh, section here is the people who are software engineers who just handle the data. So that employs a lot of people. And then once you get the data, you have to figure out what to do with it. You have to make a model. You have to, you know, use it for something. And so quants typically come in there. So not only do they have to build the model using whatever mathematical techniques, Somebody has to code the model, typically using C++ or some other, you know, language. And then, you know, you have to test it and decide if it's, you know, good or not, which involves statistics. And then, you know, it's probably not the best model the first time, so you have to figure out how to, you know, find parameters which will optimize the performance. So, you know, again, there's various numerical, um, numerical techniques you can use for optimization. Uh, and then, you know, there's just various techniques which, again, you know, may or may not be useful depending on your strategy. But there's things called Markov chains or, um, you know, various stochastic processes you can look at or just general probability and statistics. Anyway, if, once you have this model, you have to decide if it's uh, going to, you know, make money, but also what's the risk that you're taking by putting it in place. So, again, you can, you can uh, study that with various statistics. So once you have the model, you need to give it to the traders because you know somebody has to have a license in order to trade this thing, and the 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 model actually has to connect to the exchange, which involves a lot of software, a lot of programming. So that's another um, job category, and the um, the actual once the trade happens, you know there, there's just a ton of uh, sort of paperwork that has to happen. Um, it's again electronic, but it's still sort of um, it's still kind of a pain. And so this all this work has to, you know all these things all these trades have to be validated, and they have to be uh, cleared. And that's another category of um, sort of software developer. So these are kind of the you know some categories of the quants that you have. There's sort of front office quants. These are people sort of who are sort of directly touching the models. So these people might be on the sell side or the buy side, pricing derivatives or, you know, making models for trading. Then there's also the risk quants, who don't actually, you know, they don't, they typically don't generate, you know, predictions or anything like that. But they're involved with just taking whatever um, strategy you have in place and making sure that the risk is under control. So that's another just large uh, class of of jobs. And then you know the software people. There's there's sort of there's people who just do basic programming 
And then there's sort of quantitative programming. So there, the quant developer is, an, is, a, um, is a sort of special class of, of job where it's somebody who's got the quantitative skills. Typically, they're a PhD in some sort of quantitative area. But they're also very good with, with the programming. And so they're, they're actually able to code these. Because you, know, you want someone, when you're actually coding the model, you want someone who um, understands the model pretty well. You don't just want to just pass that off to somebody who's a good programmer. So these are people with sort of a combination of quantitative skills and programming skills. OK, so um, maybe I'll just say a few words about sort of how I got here uh, talking about this. Because it's, you know, again, a very nonlinear story. I didn't set out to uh, you know, be a quantitative financial person. So um, as Alan was mentioning, I started off in the field of low dimensional topology. And I was just focused on a research career. So maybe I'll just say a little bit about low dimensional topology. So let M be a closed hyperbolic three manifold. OK. <laughs> Sorry, so that was the one joke in the, in the talk. <laughs> so I was showing this to the guy in, in HR, and he complained, there's no jokes in the talk. Where's the jokes? I said, come on, that's a joke. Um, but um, anyhow, so I was, I was doing this research. And um, yeah, let's go back here first. So. Um, it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed, um, you know, studying low-dimensional topology. Uh, I love math. Uh, I had a great time here at UT. Um, Alan was a great advisor, and um, you know, it's it's, um, it's a really fascinating area. So I went off and I did my postdoc, and uh, you know, I w then I went on to this other job at Buffalo. And um, I guess sort of what happened, sort of the short the short version is that um, you know it just was. A bit lonely, frankly. I mean, so you're sitting there with your problem. Somehow, I don't know, my personal sort of style of doing math is just to sort of, you know, hear the problem and then just go off into the corner for six months and, you know, uh, not talk to anybody. So um, I guess I was just sitting in my office one day, you know, in Buffalo, um, just with some intractable problem in my head and watching the snow sort of blow <laughs> and the wind howl outside my window. And I just started to, you know, think about what the options were uh, at that point. So uh, then, you know, when you start thinking about what the options are, um, you know, there, there are a lot. And, um, you know, there's, there's sort of a lot of people, you know, the math, math skills are highly in demand in a lot of fields right now. So, you know, statistics is, is extremely important in all sort of walks of life right now. Um, so I just started looking at what the various options might be. And, um, you know, I had a friend who had gone off to work at an investment bank uh, who was a topologist. And uh, he seemed quite happy there. And so I talked to him. And basically, in my case, I just started looking at the financial um, world and the financial literature. And it was sort of much more interesting than I'd expected it to be. Um, you know, so some of these, um, you know, some of these concepts, if you, if you look at some of this sort of pricing theory for derivatives and stuff, it's actually very elegant, very sort of um, you know, aesthetically pleasing math. Now, there's, there's a drawback to that, was, which I think I mentioned before, is that I think some people who come from academics uh, get sort of too seduced by the sort of pretty math that goes into the uh, models. And so you, you, you end up with sort of big problems. But, but, but still, I mean, the, the fundamental point here is that you know, the stock market is a fairly interesting thing. It's, an, it's not, not well understood. And you know, there's a lot of interesting questions about it. Uh, so that sort of got me interested. And then I just started um, you know, applying for jobs. Um, it's a little hard for me to tell you, give you advice about applying for jobs. You know, it's uh, the time I was doing it was sort of right when the financial crisis hit, which you know. So I think things changed at that point. I don't know if they've changed back particularly. Um, you know, there's still plenty of jobs out there. It's just that I think the former path used to be people would just sort of uh, come from a math PhD or something or a physics PhD, and they could just go straight to Wall Street and get like 15 interviews. Um, and I think that's probably changed. There's actually a lot of competition now for those derivative jobs, for instance. There's a lot of people that just go to get a master's or even a PhD you know, already focused on getting one of those jobs. Um, so you know, it's, it's, it's a little hard to just sort of say exactly, um, you know, to sort of zero in on something, I think. I think, you have to, I think it helps to be a little bit more open to what the different possibilities are. Um, so in my case, I just, you know, I, I sort of talk to people. So I recommend doing that, just talk to you know, as many people that you know, or even people that you don't know, you know, just sort of general job seeking advice is just to network as much as you can. And then, um, you know, uh, see what's out there. 
so in my case, I just this job that I got turned out to just be a CV that I sent off, and you know, it was nothing really uh, sort of uh, special that I did to get it. I just happened to the guy they happened to look at my resume, and uh, it worked out. But um, just in general, you know, I, I think that um, people do come from different backgrounds, and uh, I think if you just sort of get interested in something. I think it helps to be interested. So you know, if you if you look at this stuff and it has no sort of doesn't grab you at all, that's probably a bad sign. But if it's sort of something you can get interested in, then you know, there's you can talk to people, and you can also, if you're in an academic setting, you can try to sort of look at the the academic literature. Maybe you could even try to write some papers or something. Try to see what the open problems are. I mean, typically that won't have anything to do with what you end up doing, but at least it will sort of help get your foot in the door as far as demonstrating an interest and. Um, Sort of, you know, it's a good way to learn things too. Um, so, as far as people are always asking me, like, what's what's it like compared with academics? So, um, you know, to say a couple words about that. I mean, it's it's a very different world from academics, but it's actually not as different as I had expected uh, when I sort of started thinking about it. So, you know, I read some book. Um, there's a great book called Liars Poker by Michael Lewis, um, describing the experiences of some bond trader, some junior bond trader at Solomon Brothers in the 80s. And um, <laughs> it was very scary. You know, it's like these guys, these traders would like, you know, throw things at you. And like, uh, you know, it, it, apparently it was a very sort of testosterone fueled and scary place. But the, uh, you know, my company anyway, and I think this is true for a lot of companies now, it's, it's totally different. I mean, so, you know, my, the big boss at my company is a physics PhD. And, you know, everybody I work with basically has a PhD. And, you know, PhDs are just, you know, they tend to be more comfortable in academic environments, I think. So, um, you know, it really doesn't feel that much different from academics. Um, you know, there, there's differences. You know, you know, I used to be, every, every day after lunch, I used to take a nap uh, in my old job. And uh, so the first, the first day of my new job, you know, after lunch, <laughs> I, was, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I started, my eyes started drooping. But, you know, so I just walked around. But, but um, you know, so, so there's some differences. But, but basically, everything is sort of, at least from my experience, uh, you know, it's very sort of nerdy. And uh, things are, you know, the decisions are all sort of made scientifically. Um, you know, the, I think that's one thing that has changed is that, you know, quants used to be a novelty. Like, you know, so these guys, that were, the first sort of physics guys that went to Wall Street, you know, they were just, uh, <laughs> view, you know, people did not know what to think of these guys. They thought, you know, uh, they thought they were just sort of hopelessly head in the clouds, and, um, you know, they got made fun of. And <laughs> um, but now I think the, uh, you know, I think that the sort of, it, the culture has changed so that um, it, at least at a typical, you know, if, if you're at some company that has a quantitative emphasis, then, you know, it's, it's going to be sort of more of a, sort of academic environment than a um, sort of crazy, like, five-screen traders yelling at each other kind of environment. Um, so let's see. Let me just, uh, I have a couple slides here. In case you're interested in, um, you know, what you can do to sort of brush up on skills for interviewing or something. Um, so I have some slides. If somebody's actually, you know, so when we interview people, it really doesn't matter how much they know. I mean, we'd rather just have people that um, you know have a good background and that we think are sort of you know talented people, and then we're happy to teach them stuff. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, there's a lot of jobs where you know, like for instance, a lot of these Wall Street jobs, you know, they want to you want they want you to demonstrate that you that you've sort of learned something, you know, and uh, even if it's just like in the last three months, it does help for some of those other jobs to um, you know learn some of this basic stuff about the financial uh, techniques. So this is just a list of some stuff. You know, I can send you slides or something if you're interested in seeing more about this. Um, but there's some just sort of basic interview questions that people tend to get asked, um, and some basic things that are actually very useful to know once you do get at one of these jobs. So, and yeah, there's a reading list that was might be useful for you. There's a bunch of um, interview questions are collected in some of these some of these books. And there's also, you know, uh, this first book by Emmanuel Derman is kind of interesting if you want to just read another perspective on somebody who let, went from physics to Wall Street. Um, and he's a very good writer, so that's a fun read. Um, this, uh, this other book by Kuznetsov is, is very good for people who are serious about making this transition because 
you know, it's also it's also written by a physicist, and he gives you the sort of the whole history of you know a lot of the stuff I talked about here. He gives in much more detail with much more history, and he's a, you know a very good writer, and he's very sort of practical. So he'll show you, okay, this is what the computer screen looks like, you know, for this you know particular um, ECM or whatever. Uh, so I think with that, I'll just these are some uh, spam things. Uh, so Quant Lab is hiring. So um, you know, I'm happy to talk to anybody who uh, thinks they might be a good fit. We have actually, even if you're not interested, you know, uh, perhaps if you're just a, a grad student or even an undergrad, you know, there's potential uh, sort of internship uh, opportunities. So we have these deals where you can just come work for the summer, and um, you know, we uh, just try to sort of put you on some sort of narrow problem where you can hopefully make a contribution, and then um, you know, then you can sort of go back and go back to your thesis work or whatever when the summer's over. So that's it. Thank you.